Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service. Welcome to Gordon. Gordon is Keith's brother. Thanks for being with us today. The Lord be with, us, with you. And also with you. Welcome. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, in whom there are no borders, who recognizes no nationalities, welcoming all sojourners into the promised land. Amen. Amen. Trusting in God's welcome to all sinners and saints, let us confess our sin against God and one another. Eternal parent of all, you created us as your children, so we are all related. We have denied our relationship to one another. We have built boundaries out of fear, out of anger, out of desires for control and power. We call for justice, but forget about mercy. We have divided what you declare whole. We have devalued what you declare worthy. We have dehumanized one another, the creation you called very good. Forgive us for our fear, our desire for power, our thirst for justice without mercy. Forgive us for seeing ourselves as separate and our siblings as other. Help us to see in ourselves and one another what you see in us. Empower us to tear down the boundaries that separate us from one another and inevitably from you. Strengthen us that we might lift up our voices when your children cry out in pain. May we be for others the refuge we find in you. Renew our hearts, O oh God, through the power of your Son, Jesus Christ. 
hear the good news. Jesus came to call us to repentance. Jesus died that we might be forgiven. Jesus was resurrected that we might know eternal life. In his name, your sins are forgiven. Turn towards God and sin no more. Amen. Amen. our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal yourself. Bring wholeness to all that is broken. Speak truth to us in our confusion. That all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The psalm today is Psalm 111. Let us pray. Hallelujah. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, 
pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. Earth and the stars, Lord, rushing planets, sing to the Lord a new song. And wind and rain, Lord, blowing snowstorm, sing to the Lord a new song. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. Trumpet and pipes, loud clashing cymbals, sing to the Lord a new song. Harp, lute and lyre, loud humming cellos, The works of your hand are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. Engines and the steel, a loud pounding hammers, sing to the Lord a new song. Limestone and the beams, a loud building workers, sing to the You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. Knowledge and truth, love sounding wisdom, sing to the Lord a new song. Daughter and a song, a loud The reading in today is from 1 Corinthians, chapter 8. Now, concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. But anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temples of an idol, they might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols. So, by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is the cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Sat 
in the darkness have seen a great light. For those who sat in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching? With authority, he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Possessed by the Holy Spirit, fresh from successfully confronting Satan in the wilderness, preaching the reign of God, and now in the company of at least four followers, it's time for Jesus' public ministry to gather momentum. It's time for a fight scene with some real action. The scene in a Capernaum synagogue, a setting of prayer, teaching, worship, and community gathering, centers around questions of Jesus' authority. Why does he do what he does? For whom does he speak and act? Who has authorized his ministry? The answers to those questions emerge through fights, contests and controversies, really. Mark wants us to know here at the outset of Jesus' public ministry that Jesus' authority will be a contested authority. Jesus' presence, words, and deeds threaten other forces that claim authority over people's lives. These other authorities have something to lose because they were successful for so long and have made lots of profit from keeping everyone else down and little. And so many people even bought into it and thought it was right and good that a few were super rich and held all the power and most people didn't have a say in anything, not even their own lives. They try to hold on to their power by any means possible, even if it's just a relative power given to them by the people in actual power. Dependent power still feels like power. The man with the unclean spirit finds Jesus. He initiates the whole exchange. His opening question conveys a sense of why are you picking this fight? Or couldn't you have just left things as they were between us? Jesus, by his sheer presence in the synagogue, has upset the order. He has crossed an established boundary, which is the greatest crime one can commit in the eyes of most, to disturb the order. The contest does not last long, for this is not the fairest of fights in terms of the strength of the combats. We can't be sure whether the spirit's next question, have you come to destroy us, is a fearful acknowledgement that his doom is sealed or an arrogant but miscalculated boast. Have you come to destroy us is spoken by the demons, but in Mark's narrative, it represents the scribe's opinion, the people in dependent power. Later on in the Gospel, according to Mark, the scribes will accuse Jesus of performing miracles by the power of the Prince of Demons, because miracles that upset power structures can't be done in the name of God, at least in the scribes' opinion, which in Mark's view makes the scribes' teaching demonic, because it does not liberate but oppresses and enslaves people. 
a liberating act is needed and Jesus does it. The spirit is soon gone, expelled from the man with a few words from Jesus. No prayers, no formulas, no props, just commands. Get out of here. Mark gives no information about what happens to the spirit. It appears to become disembodied, but not destroyed. When Jesus strips the spirits of the ability to inhabit their human hosts, Jesus denies the unclean spirit's capability to have a settled place or entrenched influence in the world. Losing opportunities to win over people's bodies and minds, unclean spirits lose the authority they were thought to have. But this exorcism does not eliminate evil and oppression. It denies those kinds of forces the authority and power to hold ultimate sway over people's lives. Yet, there's still evil in this world. And no, it does not have the last say. It doesn't have a say at all if Jesus is there. Demons are real. They possess us and they are intent on, on destroying us. They will be disguised as things we actually value, like self-esteem, overprotection, love, work ethic, perfectionism. We might say that we want to help and empower the poor and mean that we can't see any value in the way those people live and that we need to save them because our way is the only way to humanly live. We might say that we want to evangelize and mean that we don't care about other religions and faith traditions and that our way is the only way to be close to God. As if God had to rely on our strength and our power of persuasion to be close to every human being on earth. We might hope that the people we feed or give backpacks to or help will feel obliged to worship with us while forgetting that we fed our own kids with both food and the word of God and yet most of them don't worship with us anymore. The demons are many out there and we have great expertise in denying them. And we need to cast those demons out because Jesus did and because they keep us from loving others like God loves them and us. So how do we do this? First, we have to name them. And second, we have to command them to leave and then stick with it. That's the hardest. Naming the demons is a way to recognize that they exist. Let's start with the biggest one and the one I as a pastor fear the most actually, because it would not just cost me my life with God, but also my job. The demon called unbelief, losing one's faith in God, in life as a sacred force and in our fellow human beings. It is the feeling that nothing can be done to solve our problems. And I have to be honest, this demon that our problems are here to stay has been quite present during the last year. When it seems as if it never gets any better, when people keep dying and getting sick, when every time one person gets off the streets, there are more becoming unhoused, when I walk around and see the misery people find themselves in, this incredible loneliness. The other day, I brought food to an elderly woman. She lives in a studio and had just joined our neighborhood group on Facebook. I asked her how long she has been living there. Over 12 years, she said. Out of those, I have been sick for 10 years. I just started getting better. She doesn't know anybody and even though she gets help from the city, they only deliver her 10 meals out of 14 she would need for a week. She's homebound, lives on disability, and she's lovely, wonderful to talk to, witty and great. When I left her, I wanted to scream. It seems like every time I turn around, there's another human being suffering and all I can do is help a tiny bit to make it better, but it never seems to get good. The demons of social isolation seem to stick. It's hard not to lose hope. It's hard to trust God when the world seems to fall apart. It's hard to have faith when there is suffering all around us. And yet, it's all we can do, or else we would be doomed to disparity. And we can pray. 
Praying is not a pious resignation to God's will or an exercise that puts our minds at ease. It's an intensely personal struggle to resist the despair and distractions that cause us to practice unbelief, to abandon or avoid the way of Jesus. Praying is the struggle to believe that change can really happen, that a better world is possible. And so we pray with our hearts and minds, with our feet and hands, with our wallet and our attention, we pray. Unless we name the demons, they will name us. They will control and destroy us. Unless we distance ourselves from them, we will serve them. And that takes courage and endurance because demons are powerful. That's why they're demons and not just failures. When talking about demons, Mark implies that this is a cosmic conflict over ownership. What God called very good, demons try to destroy. What God made as one world and one people, demons divide and conquer. What God sees in us, demons hide. And so we find ourselves in a country that's polarized over basically everything. We could probably have people start a serious fight over Dunkin' Donuts versus Starbucks on Facebook and not even notice how ridiculous it is. Sure, Dunkin' Donuts is better, but you get the idea. Somehow we have come to the conclusion that we cannot talk to each other anymore and it's not even worth trying anymore, which is the end of any democracy and the end of the kingdom of God. Because it's the end of relationships and God's world is a world of relationships. And even Jesus, he talks to the demons. In this episode, the unclean spirits makes a demonic confession or recognition and calls Jesus the Holy One of God. Jesus responds by commanding him to be silent and to come out of him. That the unclean spirit is the first one to name Jesus and acknowledge his power is an early instance of Mark's ironic reversals and surprises. Evil forces have the most to lose in the coming of Jesus and the good news. Apprehending the threat Jesus poses, the spirit axes the man with one last spasmodic movement and one final cry. In this first skirmish, Jesus prevails, but not without the unclean spirit protesting and acting out. Evil forces have the most to lose in the coming of Jesus and the good news. That's how we know they are evil forces. When they act out, when there's any notion about fighting for the oppressed or getting people health care or food and housing security, that's when they act out. Somehow, God is drawn close to those unclean spirits. That's interesting because God shows up where we still least expect God, which is funny because God has always been showing up there where we still least expect God. In the outcasts and the beggars and the sick and the prostitutes and the unhoused. These are God's people. Yet somehow we need to be reminded of that because we often feel more entitled to God's love and blessing than those poor fellows. God is a God of the broken, the lost, the tired, and the possessed. God is a God that liberates you and me from our fears and worries to deal with the demons we witness. You and me from our hopelessness that anything will ever change. Because as long as God is by our side, things will change. We just have to keep calling the demons out and command them to get out of here. Because Jesus is in charge. Because love and compassion are in charge. Thanks be to God. Amen. Transgression and
join together each of us in our home church and profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For all who share the gospel and proclaim freedom in Christ throughout the world, for the church and its ministries. For all God's works in creation, plants and animals, water and soil, forests and farms, and for those tasked with protecting our natural resources and all that exists. For government and leaders, cities and nations, elected officials and grassroots organizers, for all responsible for the well being of civil society. For those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, those who are sick and hospitalized, fighting for their lives those struggling with mental illness and depression from being alone, those who are hungry or homeless and all in any need, for caregivers, hospice workers, and home health aides. For the concerns of this congregation, those who have stayed home forever, those absent from worship, those celebrating birthdays or anniversaries, for the people of God in this place. For the covenant God made with us in the waters of baptism, in thanksgiving for the baptized who have died in the Lord. For whom else and what else do we pray? Please unmute yourself if you wish to offer a prayer. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Each of us must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We appreciate your continuing financial support and your time and talent to help our ministries thrive. Thank you so very much. O oh God, receive these gifts as you receive us with arms open wide. Nourish us and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with this same love through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. Take 
hats on today, uh, the normal logistics, but also introducing the, our breakout room now. And breakout rooms are something that we, the stewardship committee started. And you may be wondering why the stewardship committee? And the stewardship committee is participating in something the, that you've heard about before, the Kaleidoscope Institute, Holy Currencies. And one of those currencies is relationships. And these breakout rooms are an opportunity to build relationships. And there have been, during these, this time of Zoom, it has not been that easy in some cases to build those relationships. And so we just wanna give this one opportunity. It's sort of a time of fellowship, a time of like sharing the peace during the church service. Today's topic is how do you connect with your family? How did you connect with your family over the holidays? And you have the option of talking about this topic in the breakout room or something else. It just doesn't matter. It's not obviously a theological discussion in this case. You're all back and now you're muted and we got to figure out how to go on here. I um, hope you enjoyed it. Let's see, the next person is Pastor, and so we've got to spotlight her. The Lord be with us. We lift up our hearts, we lift them to the Lord. We give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O oh God. Praise to you for your blessings to all of us. Praise for open hearts and ongoing prayers. Praise to you for the spirit of love and truth. Praise to you for rain and wind, for honest conversations and silly laughter and just hanging in. God, we praise you, joining our voices with all the faithful and doubting and wandering saints of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. institution together with me so that they will be spoken and can be heard in every single one of our home churches. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ Let us join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. 
our Father, Father is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Your will be done. Father, I will be done. This day our daily bread. Today our daily bread. 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 Our daily bread.
Now stay safe and go in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.